discussion uh, c between panel members and members of the audience. If this is not what you want to hear, you're in the wrong room and this would be a good time to, uh, to leave. Um, we have a panel. Oh, I should introduce myself first. I'm George Sadowski. I'm the executive director of the Global Internet Policy Initiative. And we have a panel of uh, distinguished experts in various aspects of uh, uh, network operators, work in developing countries, et cetera. And directly to my left and uh, to your right is uh, Sylvia Cadena, who's a project officer uh, of the Information Society Innovation Fund in Australia. Uh, to her right is Bernadette Lewis, uh, who is Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Uh, to her left is uh, uh, Richard Misech, General Manager of uh, Palau National Communications Corporation. Uh, the next person is Gaurab Raj uh, 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 pardon me, Opadaya, um, who is Chair of the Board of Directors of the Asia and Pacific Internet Association, headquartered in Kathmandu, Nepal. And finally, uh, oh, sorry, uh, we have um, uh, Adiel Aplogan, who is the uh, CEO and president of Afrinic, headquartered in, I believe, Mauritius. So we have uh, quite a bit of regional representation here. And the uh, title of the workshop is particularly appropriate for the IGF in that one of the cross-cutting themes of the IGF is how can we use information and communications technology, and in particular the internet, to aid uh, in the development process, to aid social and economic development in really all countries of the world, but in particular uh, the countries that we think of normally as in the developing uh, set of countries. Uh, in addition, uh, the focus on network operators is particularly relevant because uh, if uh, the network operators and the ISPs that they work for uh, aren't successful, the internet is going to spread. Not going to spread. Uh, we need success a successful internet industry in every country, no matter how small, to ensure that uh, uh, that the uh, people in the country have the possibility of getting access to the net in a way that is sustainable. And for that, we need a sustainable uh, internet industry. We need ISPs that can function and be profitable. We need network operators that know what they're doing and understand the difficulties, the, uh, the challenges they face, and are able to meet them. Uh, now, this particular panel is going to um, deviate somewhat from the uh, format of some of the other panels. First of all, uh, you may be pleased to know that there will be no PowerPoint. No PowerPoint allowed. Uh, Vince Cerf, who's one of the fathers of the internet, has a saying. He says, uh, uh, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Uh, <laughs> there are, as, as you know, if you've, if you've been following any of the discussions about the relevance of PowerPoint, there is a sizable body of people who think that PowerPoint is used to uh, organize uh, ideas in a, a palatable way, but not necessarily in the best substantive way. So what we are doing here is we are going to be discussing various issues and we are going to be uh, uh, including you uh, at the audience uh, to some extent in pauses between our discussions. Now the other uh, innovation is that we are not going to have a set of speakers that will uh, provide one by one uh, presentations, but we're going to be issue oriented instead. Several weeks ago, uh, Samantha Dickinson, who is the organizer of this, uh, of this panel, wrote to the various panelists and said, what are the issues that you think ought to be discussed uh, in such a panel? What the, the challenges that network operators face? And she got a variety of responses, and she has grouped them uh, by issue categories. And uh, if everything's working right, you should see the, uh, the website with the first set of issues on the screen. Uh, and they're grouped into five categories, capacity building, technical challenges, markets and competition, policy and regulation, oh, and six issues, uh, costs, costs have been broken out as a, as, a, as a significant issue, and then there are a variety of other issues that didn't seem to categorize very well, and they're listed in the other category. So my proposal is that we go through each of these issue uh, clusters 
and various panel members have uh, uh, the background and experience to speak to various of these issues, and we'll have a discussion among ourselves. Maybe we have uh, 90 minutes for the session, uh, probably about 10 minutes for every uh, uh, set of issues. We'll have a pause after the first two to take a couple of comments and questions from uh, you uh, people who are participating with us uh, in the workshop. Uh, we'll do that again after the fourth set, and uh, if there's time left over, uh, we will continue the discussion uh, with the panel and you uh, on any of the uh, issues or issue areas that you choose to, uh, to address. All right, so that's the format. Uh, and uh, uh, the panel has been, uh, has, has met and has, is uh, ready to go, uh, and I hope that this will be a good format for, uh, uh, for addressing these various things. Uh, the, the problem of a network operator, of an ISP in a developing country, is not dissimilar uh, from some problems that uh, uh, exist with, with every ISP, even in developed countries. On the other hand, as you, as you know, uh, developing countries have issues that make it more difficult for businesses to survive, uh, to be profitable. Uh, there are issues of knowledge, of experience uh, that, that enter in that uh, cause the, um, and the ISPs and the network operators in developing countries to probably have a harder time of it. Uh, and it's important that we, we understand what those issues are, what the challenges are, and uh, to some extent I hope we're going to be able to shed some light on what network operators might be able to do to surmount those challenges and become more successful. Okay, so the first issue area is capacity building. Um, and uh, I'd like Gaurab to, um, uh, to start this discussion. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, glad to be here uh, with so many parallel sessions ongoing. Thanks for coming. And I, as George said, uh, amongst other things, I also run the Internet Exchange in Kathmandu and see the South Asian Network Operators Group, and I'm pretty much involved in uh, APNIC uh, policy process plus APRICOT and so on and so forth, and work quite closely with a lot of operators in this region. Uh, so I'm glad to be the first speaker. Uh, yeah, the first point that we discussed earlier and kind of pointed out was one of the things that I see happening or, or lack of a problem is capacity building. Um, you know, trainings, getting ex operators exposed to the right way of doing things. Because uh, when I look at it, internet and internet technologies have been around in the U.S. and Europe for many years now. People have learned how to make those networks, they have made mistakes, they have learned from it, and now there is a set of best common practices as well as, you know, people have transferred that knowledge down to new engineers and so on and so forth. Whereas in a lot of developing countries, you know, until very recently, most of it was restricted to an incumbent, uh, internet and any other kind of infrastructure, and the incumbent had a consultant hired from somewhere doing work who left. And then suddenly you are left with an infrastructure that the demands on which is growing very, very rapidly as more users get connected to the network, but at the same time they don't really have the local expertise or the capacity to work through that system. So that is, that is one of the major things as I, as I see is in order for operators to, you know, adopt new technologies, expand their networks, adhere to the best common practices, use the right technology for the right problem, they need a lot more capacity building. And, and, and when I say capacity building and training, it doesn't mean that somebody from you know, somewhere comes and does a training. And uh, as I was discussing this with my uh, friend earlier this week, Michael there, uh, he, he gave me that term demanding infrastructure. And anybody who has worked in Nepal or India or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or any of the islands know that we have to deal with a very specific set of problems, uh, which may, will not exist in Europe or the U.S. or any of the other <coughs> more developed countries. And a lot of times I've seen issues whereby, you know, the experts come in from the more advanced countries because they've done the work, but then when having to deal with this more demanding infrastructure, uh, which may be that the power is not working, um, there is no ground in any equipment. Uh, you know, you have to use trees instead of towers for antennas and things like that. They start to fail, and that that creates a lot of more problem. But at the same time, people in other countries in the south have dealt with those problems. So one of the things I see required in terms of capacity building 
is to get this inter-South cooperation, our people in developing countries working with people in other countries and exchanging and sharing information more you know, specific to that kind of need. And as, as I learned this week, a lot of people are doing work in India, and I hadn't met them before. And I would do a lot of work in Nepal, and we share a lot of similar issues in many areas. So that, that, that'll be one of the things, of course, a lot of people are working in capacity building, but as a takeaway from this discussion, I hope that you know, people are sensitized to get more people from within the region talking to each other and collaborating and training rather than somebody parachuting in and then you know, flying out very quickly uh, and not really leaving anything there for the locals to take out. Uh, who on the panel wants to add to that? Sylvia? Sylvia? The, the other aspect that um, we found in the several projects that, that, have been, uh, that have been involved in the past is also the fact that uh, organizations invest, the ISPs invest a lot of money and time and effort to um, uh, help their, lo their, their local staff to get trained and improve their capabilities. But then when they have invest all that money and they don't invest all that effort, this, this staff is also more valuable, and they have offered more, better opportunities elsewhere, and they just fled the country or that particular company and joined other workforces. So it's also the question of how, how do you manage, how do you balance the capacity building initiatives and programs that you put in place inside in your own organization and environment with proper job opportunities and challenges that keep the staff motivated and involved in the work that they're doing, but also improving their life conditions. And that's something that it can't be taken for granted, especially in developing countries where earning money is a big issue. And although um, uh, it's much more likely that young professionals that are just starting their careers and are more uh, romantic in a way can uh, accept that job opportunities. But if you want to keep your staff, you have to do much more effort in terms of keeping them there and, and help them to develop their own, uh, uh, to improve their, their, their well-being. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, retention of, of qualified personnel is an issue in, I suspect, most departments in most developing countries. But uh, I have a question. Uh, suppose, uh, suppose money weren't an issue. Uh, forget the retention issue for the moment, but concentrate on training. Uh, if you had a lot more money, what programs in the past have really worked? What would you emphasize? Uh, is there a silver bullet here? Is there something that, uh, a pattern, a, a template that you could use to uh, really accelerate the, uh, the, the training and the, of, of uh, network operators? Uh, well, I think there are uh, um, several initiatives for training um, network operator or engineer, uh, specifically on internet-related service. We have the, the network operator group in several regions who uh, would organize um, regular training on internet-specific issue. Uh, and, uh, and they are great uh, training opportunity and have a great curriculum. But uh, there is also a reflection about going uh, further uh, to that. Um, how are we involving the academic, uh, uh, um, the, the academia themselves in this kind of curriculum? How can we impact the curriculum at the university so that people who are graduate from the university, who get their diploma at university, already have the basement of it? Maybe it is an, a new way of uh, injecting this um, uh, internet-related service into into young people who are coming, so so, so that they have it. So it. it I'm, I'm just throwing here the possibility of going further than the one week, two week specific training to something more uh, uh, sustainable in the longer, longer term by impl uh, involving more um, um, academic uh, sector. Yeah. 
If I may, George, I just wanted to add that it is important that the training is relevant to the environment um, and that you focus on appro the, appro the use of effective use of appropriate technology because we're talking, when well, you said forget the costs, but cost is a serious issue, especially where you're talking about the technology and so on. And I think we must focus on getting the maximum possible benefit out of any technology we invest in. And the training must be such that it allows us to innovate and not just do, this is what the, the thing is supposed to do, let's innovate and see what other benefits can be derived from the technology. And this, of course, is, it has to do with how your engineers, how your technicians are trained um, and to, for the environment in which they operate um, in getting the most out of the technology. Um, my comment is about that it's also important that the people that receive the training even if it's for a couple of weeks or a week in, uh, away from home, then they have the collaboration platforms that allow them to continue engaging the people that they met during the training that they attend so they can get support when they're, they're, they are back in the field. So collaboration platforms and emailing lists, forums that are hand in hand with the training that you took are already are also very important. And the fact that um, sometimes uh, when choosing a, a, a training to a, a, a program to send someone, they, they send the people to the more uh, state of the art, the brand new things that maybe when they come back is not the reality that they are working on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what they need is a more basic but, but uh, uh, profound training on the infrastructure that they already have so they can be innovative on that and provide good service with what they have in hand. So it's also the reality of what are you dealing with and what is uh, the, the proper uh, course that you have to take to take the maximum benefit from the infrastructure you have and the maximum capacities from the staff you have available. So uh, what kind of training are we talking about? Is it only technical training? Are we focusing narrowly on the network operator, a person sitting in front of a computer screen and, uh, and monitoring a network? Or are there, are there other kinds of training which make the, the ISP and the network uh, work uh, well, that, is, that are necessary? Any comments on that? Yeah, ac actually in that sense, um, operators deal with a lot of issues and of course a major part of that is technology. And um, some of what I said does apply is mainly to technology and um, what Adiel added about Knox and uh, academic adding the courses, uh, improving the academic courses is uh, applicable to technology. But there are also policy issues and issues like uh, IPv6 and exhaustion of IPv4 and all of those issues uh, that are more layer 9 uh, than anything uh, below the layer 7. And ISPs need to be educated with that as well. Uh, otherwise, they'll, they'll especially lose out, again, in the run for the Internet and knowing about what's happening in the future. So both, both sides. And, uh, yeah, I think what, I mean, Jobs might know better because he used to do the GP, uh, he is the GP, GIPI, uh, Internet Policy Initiative Chair, I guess. Um, so things like that are also important. Otherwise, operators will again lose out on knowing those kind of uh, upcoming issues in the policy area. So bo both are needed. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the plug. Uh, and uh, we will get to policy, which is a big part of uh, uh, what I, I think we all agree that, are, that is needed uh, in the, by the network operators. Uh, let's move down to technical challenges, because I think some of the, uh, uh, the, the challenges re truly are technical in ways that have been mentioned and uh, are very different from the solutions that uh, we might uh, choose to implement in, developing in, a, in the developed world. Um, Who would like to start that? Bernadette, would you? Uh, this is a good segue from what you were talking about earlier. Why don't you start? All right. Thank you. I think um, at the end of the day, our operators want to be profitable. And um, I could point to a bit of the history of the Caribbean, uh, the, the ISP and operators markets. Uh, liberalization of the telecommunications sector in the Caribbean began uh, in around 2000 or so, and I'm speaking of the English-speaking Caribbean. And 
it has been going on up till the present. There are still a couple of markets that need to be liberalized, but generally you have a liberalized sector. But what has happened is that although the, the sector has been liberalized, um, new competitors have found it difficult to enter the market because the former monopoly really controls the, the, tech, the, the international uh, connectivity facilities. And as a result, you'd find that people seeking to establish an internet service provider uh, provision business, they were obligated to go to the former incumbent for international facilities. And of course, you're now competing. The former incumbent has, in itself, has its own internet service provision operation. So they're competing um, at, a, at a strict disadvantage. And um, the profitability of the, the operations become an issue. And they cannot necessarily invest in, 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 in newer technology or more efficient technology. And this is one of the things, the lack of, of technical sophistication you'd find uh, facing new entrants in, in a liberalized sector. And of course, the, also, the, you're not going to be expending significant capital in, in training if, if, if you're looking at your bottom line. And in the absence of proper technological tra uh, training, understanding of how the market is evolving, the, the market issues, the policy issues, the, those other things that, that, that go along with their technology, you're going to find that the ISPs are at a significant disadvantage and the, the technical implications you know, become very real in terms of how much they could develop their networks. And I, I'll just stop there and, and let um, someone else continue with some of these challenges. Okay. Um, Adiel, uh, you've probably seen more technical challenges in your region than most of us. Can you comment? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, uh, technical challenges are, are, are out there. Um, and. Uh, very visible in, in, in our region. Uh, but I, I will just come back to a very fundamental aspect of all of these challenges, which, are, which, are, which is the localization of all of the issue and uh, trying to find local approach uh, to them. Uh, while talking about localization, I, one of the biggest challenges uh, uh, on the tech, technical side and the internet in our region is the the local internet, I mean, the, the, the internet taken locally. When we talk about the internet, is the interconnection of network. In many um, country, in many region uh, in, in, in Africa specifically, there is no such interconnection that allow content to be uh, put in an environment where the access will be cheaper so that people can access them more, more, more easily instead of accessing uh, 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 content or information which are outside. Because we, when we talk about content, we have also to talk about where those content are stored, how people are accessing uh, those content. So, so the localization of the network itself is, is, is fundamental uh, when talking about the challenge. And that doesn't exist. If that doesn't exist, we cannot talk about the internet uh, uh, per se. Um, and this challenge can, can be fixed uh, through collaboration between network operators policy makers and regulators because it is a, co a, co a co collaborative approach that can, can um, allow the emergence of internet working in, in, in our region. Another challenge which is again uh, linked to the localization of the problem is research and development. Uh, we have issue. We have uh, issues which are not the same as in developed country. Uh, the solution for those issues should come from ourselves. We, we have to uh, do research based on how we want to solve those problems, how, how we want to solve them with the resources we have. So uh, again, the involvement of the research uh, uh, community, the academic community in facing those, this problem is very imp important. This is something that doesn't exist also because uh, the, the, the linkage does not exist. The community around the development does not exist. So um, uh, those are two points that, that um, I would just like to put on the table. Yeah. Um, on that, I think also is the fact that uh, 
it's not only the, the emphasis should not be put only on the technologic technological deployment of the network, but also how do you engage the community and how do you train the community to take the, be the best, um, to use the network or the services that are provided in the better way. So you don't find out yourself with lots of, let's say, uh, antennas or, I don't know, with clothes hanging on top being not, not used at all because just the community that just didn't know what was happening there and they were never approached by anyone trying to explain them this is a service that you can use and how do you engage the community in using that and paying for that and in, in um, receiving the, the training that they also need at their end to use the services effectively and, uh, and that's also another aspect of the capacity building and, and, and training is how the providers provide training to their users and so, so the network is, is uh, more resilient. Anybody else on the panel want to comment? Yes. Yeah, thank you, George. Um, I want to put a spin on uh, Sylvia's comment as well. Uh, on the island environment where I'm from, we have a small island separated by vast oceans and one of the major issue for us, or the challenges for us, is connectivity. Uh, whereas these islands have no other ways to connect to each other, uh, other than satellite capacity, and that's domestic. And, and with that, uh, Sylvia mentioned about the, the stakeholders, the community. What do they know, what we need to educate them with to make this investment worthwhile so that it, get, it gets value to the community and the users in academia, health, and all other areas of industries. These are some of our challenges. Now, some of, probably not a silver bullet as, as what George mentioned, but some of the things we have tried in the islands is to try to uh, gain participation of the, uh, the local uh, stakeholders, the, the health, the education, the interagencies of the government to come together and establish what they think is realistic approach to fit the needs of those communities. And then from there, we at least have a baseline to draw on what investments are required, what awareness needs to be provided to the community, so that way we can end the day with substantial value of the investment. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, one more point is the brain drain that Sylvia also mentioned. Um, some of the, um, the items that we tend to uh, look at is to give incentives, give incentives to the local um, residents in training and capacity building to draw them to come back home and help these developments. And what we do is we give them programs, collaboration with the universities and colleges through some arranged, uh, arranged agreements with their students. So when they complete their school, they have loans to pay, they have fees to pay. Now we can give that incentive, say, okay, we'll bring you home, you stay for three years, now in return you get this and this and that. So those are just some of the things that we do in the islands. I just wanted to share. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two interventions from the floor. Who's got a question or a comment? One back there, and uh, I don't see a second yet. A second, okay. Uh, do we have a roving microphone somewhere? Sorry, I didn't check on that beforehand. Yes, good. In the back first. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, I'm Ray Polzak from uh, Aaron. Uh, back to the training issue. Uh, too often, uh, training, there's no innovation in the development of training and the delivery of training. And it's probably the weakest link in training. Uh, too often there is only the one model that's used, which is the uh, uh, teacher-student. You send some person someplace, they get a group of people together, and they talk, and everybody leaves. Uh, there's some problems with that, uh, one of which is finding technically qualified people to do it. And the second one is finding technically qualified people to do it who speak the language of the people you're trying to teach. So uh, innovation here says find other ways of doing this, uh, producing exportable training materials uh, that can be multi-language, multimedia. Uh, you should not be afraid to be innovative here. 
should not be afraid to produce uh, materials in multiple languages, should not be afraid to produce uh, computer-based uh, type training, should not be afraid to produce uh, illustrated uh, materials, uh, comic books, everything of that nature. Because in the end, what you really want to do if you're going to be proliferating training is training trainers who are in turn facilitators that help develop this infrastructure that you're looking for. So when you talk of innovation, you must talk of innovation in the training development realm. Thank you, Ray. That's a provocative comment. I'd like a follow-up, though, with you. Uh, I know that most of your region is well-trained, uh, but some of it isn't. Are, is Aaron prepared to, uh, to do something like this? Do you have it on your agenda? Well, uh, you can ask uh, Bernadette what we've done in the Caribbean. Uh, so uh, we also have done uh, uh, work, for example, uh, in the southwestern portion of the United States where the uh, Navajo uh, Nation is. Uh, we produce uh, materials in multiple languages, uh, and uh, we are not afraid to take on any language. Uh, one of the things that we do to practice this is that uh, at every regional internet registry meeting where we go make a presentation, we always produce the material in the local language. So we have done it in many languages. It is uh, hard to think about it when you start, but once you get a translation agency that's working for you and is used to your language and used to the technical language, uh, it becomes much easier. So it's like everything else. When you learned to ride a bicycle, it was difficult to start, but as you got to know it, you could then ride with no hands and everything else. And just one more follow-up. Uh, there's nothing about uh, network operation in Aaron that is so specific that it can't be applied to other regions. Uh, are these materials available for other regions? Uh, we do have it exportable, and uh, we are not afraid to produce it in languages that are outside of our region. We produce for the major languages of our region, which are English, Spanish, and French. But uh, we are not afraid to do it in other languages as well. Thank you. Let's have the second. In fact, we've done it in Swahili. Uh, uh, let's have the second comment. <laughs> uh, it's, it's right up here. Yes. Yeah, th uh, thanks. So I'm, I'm Paul Wilson from, from APNIC, and uh, thanks to all the panelists for an interesting panel. I, I also wanted to mention uh, human resources and reiterate the, the absolute critical importance of human resource development in, in, uh, in my direct experience. I think we've got a... Um, an interesting example all around us of the fact that uh, we can have uh, internet technology available to us, an internet infrastructure available to us, and in the form of the wireless network and the connectivity that we have here, uh, we, those of us who are trying to use it will find that sometimes it works perfectly well. It's a, it's the hosts, I think, have done an excellent job in providing a system that actually does uh, work and has, has, has proven that it can work. Unfortunately, also, it's probably rather an, am an ambitious task to provide this level of infrastructure to this size of meeting. And unfortunately, sometimes that very same infrastructure is not working terribly well at all. It's either completely offline or its performance is very, very low. Now, that's a, that shows you a, a very good example of how the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure can be there, but it is how it is managed and configured, uh, which is actually a human resource challenge that actually determines whether or not it works or doesn't. And if you take this type of scenario and take it around the developing world where internet infrastructures are being built under extremely challenging uh, circumstances, where the, the demands for increasing the scale of that infrastructure far outstrip anything that happened in the developing world where the internet has, has, uh, has actually grown over a decade or so. And you can see that, and, uh, and any of us who've traveled widely have a personal experience that, that, that internet quality is sometimes extremely poor and whereas other times it's, it's perfectly fine. And what goes along with that is that the, the cost of providing that infrastructure, uh, the cost of providing um, a, an acceptable service is, uh, is one that increases. Uh, in other words, the, the performance you can get out of a, a given piece of infrastructure will vary immensely and a piece of infrastructure that's run well will be extremely uh, cost effective to operate once, it, uh, once you get into a, a, a realm of it not working so well, you're not getting very good performance out of your network, you're not providing very good services to your members, the cost of everything is, is, uh, is increasing. And again, because of the pace of development in, this, uh, in, this, in developing countries, the challenge of maintaining trained staff who can actually meet that challenge is just something that's on, ongoing. And uh, we see all the time at APNIC the, 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 the turnover of staff who are trained and leave 
often leave the country for uh, for for brighter brighter futures elsewhere. The training is a is a ongoing thing, and I think. Uh, the, the amazing work of the, of the ISOC network workshops that was going on 10 years ago and more gave a huge kickstart to what, what happened in many um, developing countries and it's a great, a great shame that that was not able to not only continue but actually ramp up to meet, this, uh, to meet this challenge because I think the challenge is actually bigger these days than it was back then in terms of having a, a trained work sh workforce that is, is able to, to really meet these challenges and make developing country network infrastructures work as efficiently, as cost effectively, as, as securely as the infrastructures that we enjoy in, in developing countries, so in developed countries. So I just wanted to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, any comments would be would be welcome. But I felt uh, I felt motivated to just um, give my own, uh, you know, personal emphatic support for for human resource development as an ongoing process, and we just need to keep it up. Thanks. Yeah. As well as AP Nix uh, efforts in this direction, right? <laughs> well, we we do we yeah. we do as much as we can, but we're a small yeah. a small organisation. Yeah. Would never would never uh, claim to be up to that up to that challenge. But th it does actually it does actually um, lead to the. The, the importance of leverage in training trainers and so forth, of course, which is, is, is the only way it can be done. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, let's move on now to uh, markets and competition. And this is a, a big area uh, in my mind. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the case, as, as Bernadette mentioned earlier, that uh, it, we're moving now from uh, a, a regime, a world in which uh, the monopoly PTTs are uh, in the minority. They used to be in the majority, and they truly saw the Internet as a threat to their revenue stream. They were absolutely correct in seeing that uh, and uh, tried to block it and uh, have uh, uh, nevertheless uh, largely been liberalized, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in not so good ways, and sometimes they have managed to keep special privileges associated with their, their former status so that it's difficult in many countries to get a level playing field where there can be new entrants in the uh, uh, in the ISP community in the networking community, uh, and uh, that's a problem. Uh, there is a, a maxim in economics that says that uh, 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 market structure determines market conduct, and that leads to market performance. That is, if you have a monopolist, he's going to make sure his conduct will be to keep everybody else out, and the performance will be bad in the sense that the prices will be monopoly prices, and there won't be uh, as many people able to pay them, so the market will expand more slowly. Uh, so this, this whole issue of what the Internet industry looks like and how to level that playing field uh, and how to make the markets grow faster and, uh, and help the ISPs to, uh, to survive and to thrive it is a really important issue. And Bernadette, I wonder if you'd pick up on your previous remarks and ex extend them. Certainly, George. Thank you. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from the background of what's happening in the Caribbean. We have very small markets, um, and as a result, this, there are profitability issues associated with it. But what we have seen um, with the onset of liberalization was that many licenses were granted, but the new operators could not establish their businesses because the former incumbent had control over just about everything and all the international facilities. And as a result, the price, for example, of broadband, and I'm talking now about the internet experience as dial-up versus broadband, the, the cost of, of, of broadband was, was just out of the reach of the man on the street. And given the, the pace of the, the evolution of the internet, it's a not a satisfying experience to, to, to try to access the internet with a dial-up circuit. So um, with the former monopoly player controlling the internet, the international facilities, you found that the price of, of, of the internet service was particularly high. Um, what has happened now in many of the countries, you find that the, the market is now fully liberalized and you now have competition on international circuits. Within the Caribbean, for example, a number of marine fiber systems have been established which have provided alternative facilities to what was provided by the incumbent. And with the introduction of competition on the international uh, facilities business, 
the price of broadband has come down significantly, and as a result, there has been a, a significant increase of, of um, internet uptake. So you see um, the result of competition really resulting in a, a, a more equitable uh, market for, for your new entrants and, and so forth. So, um, and I also just wanted to point to the fact that within the Caribbean you have, we are dis dispersed in the Caribbean basin and there's an issue relating to how our traffic transits, a, a lot of our traffic, the majority of the traffic transits via extra regional centers so that the use, the, there's inefficient use of our regional facilities because everything goes north to come back to the Caribbean. Um, and that is something that needs to be addressed, the whole issue of internet service providers and operators coming together to, to establish um, internet exchange points. And these are some of the things that we have been actively promoting in the Caribbean. And, and happily, we have signs of, of uh, more interest in internet service provision. Um, so um, um, internet exchange points, I'm sorry. And I think this is going to help considerably in terms of uh, reduction of transit costs, especially for the smaller ISPs in the market. Good. Who'd, who'd like to add to that on the panel? If, um, I'd like to add a question for the audience. Which, which is the biggest traffic exchange point for the entire Latin America and uh, Caribbean? Any guess? Where does intra, I mean, which is the biggest, I mean, yes, exactly, Miami, right? And which is the biggest intra-African traffic exchange point? Anyone? It is London. And for South Asia, make a guess. Like these countries in South Asia, where, where does our traffic extend? Los Angeles. Right. So that, that's where, what it comes down to is, you know, even after so many years. And a lot of these countries do have domestic exchange points now. I mean, there might not be one. There might be one budding. I mean, there are exchange points in all of the countries in South Asia now and many in Africa, though not all of them. And of course, in the Caribbean, there's different issues of, uh, as with the Pacific Islands of, uh, but there are local internet connectivities there, but intra-regional or inter-regional connectivity still is lacking. And a, a reason I see in that is a lot of countries, though they liberalize the domestic markets and let other providers come into the play, uh, they forgot to do the same thing with the international connections or international access uh, to the network, right? And that, that's becoming a bigger issue. Like I, I know the example of if, I mean, between a private operator in Nepal and a private operator in India, they can't connect to each other. So what they do is the private operator in Nepal will buy a circuit to Singapore and then connects to, say, Bharti in Singapore using Bharti fiber to go throughout India and through the sea to Singapore. And that, that's, I, I think that was completely a, you know, you know, a backward step in terms of regulation of both these countries. And same thing in Bangladesh, I mean, coming from this region, is there's an incumbent telco, and they are only connected to the under undersea cable. And there are other users or other ISPs who have more capacity on that fiber, but they still have no control or they have no way to get direct access to other countries, which means between Bangladesh and India, there is no direct circuits going back and forth. And that, that's, that's one big problem. I mean, if, if there is a uh, Latin American, or if there is a big internet center in Latin America to be developed, you know, circuits between, say, Argentina and Chile, and Brazil and Argentina, and things like that needs to open up. And it, not, it must not be like restricted to only the incumbents, which seems to be the norm. And that's why it is easier to build from like any of the Latin American countries to the US than to build within each other. So, you know, regulators and policymakers there need to develop that trust. And when I was just talking with Adiel, another classic example, there's fiber from South Africa all the way to Tanzania. It's been there for many years now, and Adiel can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that's being used in the way it should be, right? Because it's been restricted to an incumbent provider who has no incentive to use it and make it cheaper for other people to get access to it. 
So th th that is a big thing that seems to be have left out by the regulators when they liberalize the market. Thanks. I can comment on two aspects of the IXP issue, which it puzzles me uh, that after 10, 15 years we don't have more of a concentration of IXPs. But I remember working in one country where I was talking with ISPs about the notion of an exchange point, and they simply didn't trust each other. That was, it goes back to your issue of trust. They, it wasn't clear what they didn't trust, but it was clear who they didn't trust. Uh, the other uh, anomaly was, uh, and I, I don't remember the country, uh, I was working in a country where it was government's, uh, uh, government refused to allow the creation of an IXP uh, because it was seen as collusion among the uh, internet service providers. I don't understand that, but what it brought home was the notion that government needs help uh, in understanding some of these issues. The government needs training, and, and maybe we get to that in the policy side. Uh, who, do, who else would like to comment uh, on this? I would like to add um, about the when small providers are starting businesses in rural areas only covering a population in their in their local environment it's also the fact that they, there is a need to do more research and more um, exercises on alternatives way, ways to manage the ownership of the infrastructure that they are building if they are providing services for small communities and the communities are considered the owners or part of the um, cooperatives that are running these small services. It could be like in Bolivia that the mobile uh, network system is owned by the owners of the mobile, the, the mobile phones. And uh, you can go to the assembly of the cooperatives. It's held in a, in a stadium where all the members can attend. And it, it's a, a very interesting way to see that even the, if the infrastructures get bigger, you don't have to just follow the models that are uh, used in Europe or the US on how this infrastructure should be owned and managed and administered, but also we can innovate on that issues. And um, that also goes to the fact that when you are starting a small service provider in a rural area or an isolated area, sometimes the type of equipment that you need to buy it's not the one that is already homologated in your country and accessible through the local shops or the the yeah the the, the big stores that bring this equipment into the country. But if you are looking for low cost, low power equipment, then you are look you are just researching for, in some cases, experimental equipment that is. Uh, pro produced by very small companies in different places in the world and the, the fact is that you need just to find different commercialization channels to bring that equipment into your country and then you also need to learn about the, the um, homologation charges and all the things that you need to do to import that sort of equipment into your country to provide the best solution at low cost and low power in rural areas. Um, that, I, that I think that it's crucial to develop uh, networks that are efficient and resilient for the very extreme environments in rural isolated areas. Great, thank you very much. Anybody else on the panel want to come? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, George. Um, markets in the island Pacific region uh, over the years since the inception of internet in the islands uh, has shown that the challenge we have is that demand per user continues to grow almost every month or so. However, the general subscription remains static. And, and that's the biggest challenge. So if anyone has a solution for me, please talk to me after the conference. Okay, uh, anyone else? Thank you, George. I just wanted to, to point, I mean, Adele and um, some of the other panelists have certainly mentioned the issue of connectivity and the need for intra-regional links. But I wanted to point to the fact that the availability of, of local content or regional content, it's, it's, it's something that we really need to pay attention to. And it is because um, a lot of our, in the Caribbean, a lot of the, the content comes from North America, so that 
even if you wanted to, to, to foster the regional linkages, what is the content that people are going to be uh, accessing? And this is something that has to be addressed as, a, as a, I think it's a fundamental issue that has to be addressed. I think our governments need to um, move more of their services on the internet to help boost uh, the, the, the traffic. And also there must be, we have to come up with these collaborative frameworks that facilitate the, the um, creation uh, and, and, and exchange of meaningful uh, regional content. And I think this is something that we really need to pay attention to. Um, one of the challenges we, we look at in the region is, you know, destruction of the culture. You know, the culture is, is, is under uh, attack because of the, the content that, that comes from the north that, that could be inimical to our own cultural development. So I want to focus on, yes, we're talking about connectivity and access, but we want also want to have accompanying those developments, the development of a viable, meaningful regional content industry. Thank you. Yes, I, 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 I really uh, <clears throat> appreciate that approach of the content versus the, 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 the access. And, um, I have, a, I have, I have uh, an idea about that. I, I think that uh, uh, there is something missing between the work being done to interconnect and the content part. Because if we don't market or show to operators and content provider and service provider that it's cheaper for them to host their content in, on local infrastructure, whereby it is they have a lot of advantage instead of hosting them outside, we will still build local infrastructure, but we won't have content. So I think the first thing is to um, create service and government, as, as Bernard had said, government has a leading role to play there, governmental service, banking service, service that people really need. Again, we have to orient the business as a need-oriented business. Those business has to be hosted and put on the local infrastructure. If people find that they can have electricity, they can have a stub connectivity, they can have a cheaper connectivity, by putting them on local infrastructure, they will do that. And they will even contribute to have more interconnection. Uh, we have uh, several XP in, in, in several countries in Africa, but people don't really even know what impact those ISP is having on the cost of their connectivity. So. It's a, it's a global thing that we have to build the infrastructure, but we have to market them to people who have the content so that they bring those content back. It, it won't happen just um, naturally. Uh, one of the uh, very attractive areas for, um, uh, for uh, bilateral and multilateral assistance in this area has been e-government, uh, especially with respect to citizen services, precisely because that is local content and it's, uh, it's appropriate local content and it's also sometimes necessary local content. Um, in a project in Macedonia with which I'm familiar, uh, it is now the case that if you want to apply for a government job, you must apply online. Uh, and uh, that has a number of, uh, of uh, interesting uh, uh, consequences. One is that uh, the, uh, the applications, instead of going under the table to your favorite relative who works in a ministry, uh, is available on a list for public display. Uh, so you have a reduction in potential corruption, or really an actual corruption, and, uh, and you also have a more streamlined way of, uh, uh, of uh, dealing with an employment process. And the free online in Macedon uh, application in Macedonia contrasted with a $100 uh, application previously. The, the other area in which uh, uh, local content, uh, uh, sorry, the other area in which locality of um, application is, is very attractive is in procurement. To the extent that procurement's made electronic, uh, all of the, of the uh, information regarding procurement, including the bidders, including uh, the, uh, uh, the bids uh, and the award, are made available online. So there's a great interest in having access to, uh, to online resources uh, and uh, a necessity for those people who are selling to government. And government is often the largest buyer uh, of, ser of services in these countries. Let's segue to uh, policy. 
because I think this is a, a, a good place to do it. Government comes up over and over again in its ability to affect markets and therefore its ability to affect the uh, economic success or failure of, uh, of ISPs and networks. And, and uh, we could spend all day on this. Uh, it's a huge area. Uh, I want to give several examples uh, on the basis of my own experience and then turn to the, uh, the, the panel. Um, ways in which government can do it right and ways in which they can do it wrong. Uh, one way uh, is with respect to how easy it is to start a business in a country. Uh, it turns out there's, a, there's an enormous variation, and this is one of the indicators that the World Bank uses uh, in its, in its uh, ICT readiness uh, overall indication. To give you an example of the spread, in Vietnam it takes seven days and you can do it online. Um, in a large South African, sub-Saharan uh, African country, uh, which, I, which I visited, it took over 150 days. And I was shown the process, which consisted of uh, a number of extraordinarily large ledger books with handwriting uh, and uh, checks uh, and um, uh, I don't know what, uh, all kinds of uh, processes in between. Well, if you want to start uh, a network uh, operation, uh, 150 days is a long time to wait. You might go into something else. Uh, another example is uh, um, a curious one in terms of technology. Uh, the need for technology neutral integration, uh, uh, sorry, technology um, uh, neutral legislation was brought home to me in, in a large Asian country. This was three years ago, and the head of a very large service bureau uh, said to me, look, uh, wireless, we, we have problems with wireless communication in this country because when the law was passed by the parliament, it specified that wireless is, was legal with 802.11b technology. 802.11b is wireless at 10 or 11 uh, megabits per second. Uh, what had happened, of course, was that uh, uh, several advanced versions of 802.11 had, uh, had supplanted 802.11b for most purposes, and it was against the law to use them. Furthermore, uh, what had happened was that the supply of 802.11b electronics was going down, and the man said to me, uh, I can't sell wireless because I can't get the components for what's legal, and I can't offer the components that I can get. And so the notion of um, government interfering in, or interfering in this case, in the legal con uh, 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 context uh, or in the regulatory context can do a lot to either encourage to, uh, to support the way in which uh, networks and other ICT industries can grow, or it can do inadvertently or on purpose, it can stunt uh, their growth. And it's really... Um, it's really important to get the policy right, get government educated so that they understand the impl implications of their policies. This is a long run and difficult process uh, in almost every country I know, uh, including my own to, to some extent. Uh, the, uh, the, the level of knowledge of the members of the U.S. Parliament, the Congress, uh, is, leaves a lot to be lacking. So uh, with that and uh, the, with the notion that, gov that policy really matters, and it's maybe something we can do something about because it, unlike like uh, things like a level of education or a level of uh, wealth in a country, which take a long time to change, uh, policy is something we make ourselves, and we can decide uh, what's good and what's bad. And we do, of course, through the through the electoral pro the voting process. But um, somehow uh, we don't seem to get uh, some really vast improvements in policy. So, w with that as an introduction and a segue, let me ask members of the panel who want to talk about policy issues and how they how they affect the the fate of the future of uh, network operations operators and ISPs. Who'd like to start that discussion? Okay, I will, I will um, probably address two aspects of policy and regulation. Um, the first one is, is the real problem that uh, I can see uh, in several developing countries and where policy fell in, in, in several case is because the policy uh, uh, define uh, uh, not in the cooperative approach, meaning um, the, all the stakeholders, um, the operators, the government, the, and the policy maker lack this kind of true and open dialogue which will allow all, each party to understand 
the constraints of the other party and then come together into a consensual way of addressing the issue whereby the development of the internet is the key uh, and the key factor. So I think one, one thing that can help there is to find a way of creating an open environment where cooperation between different stakeholders when it comes to you know, putting in place policy uh, which will regulate the market uh, is, is set up with the wider knowledge of the technology, the wider knowledge of the trend where the technology is going. Uh, um, there are policy in country which will disallow, for instance, uh, uh, people who have Wi-Fi uh, license to provide Wi-Fi service to people who hold mobile phones who are Wi-Fi compatible because they cannot provide, provide the service because it's considered as a mobile uh, 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 service, for instance. But why? because the regulation or the law in place doesn't understand that it's something that can be easily Im implemented on mobile phone. Or people have mobile phone who have Wi-Fi, and they use Wi-Fi also. So it's, it, 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 it is something that uh, needs to be addressed with the uh, input of expert local, you know, expert and local people who understand the market, who understand the challenges, and who, can, who has the, 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 the right uh, vision in terms of uh, development. The second aspect of, of regulation and policy is also um, linked to the threat in several countries in Africa to put in place regulation that will, at the end of the day, create another kind of monopoly of another kind of dominate, dominant uh, operators uh, uh, because um, the, 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 the policy is set up in, 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 in the way that a uh, newcomer uh, buy the incumbent telecom and uh, through some uh, lack of uh, good governance in terms of regulation uh, have the regulator in their side and become another dominant operator because they don't have anything to care about in terms of law and regulation, making newcomers or small uh, operators uh, struggling a lot to have access to the infrastructure at the first place and to compete in a very fair uh, uh, footage. Um, so that's two, two aspects that I will just um, put for discussion and have uh, more comment if any. Thank you, Ariel. Actually, carrying forward from what Ariel said, uh, what I've seen or what I've observed is a lot of the regulations that have been set up in the last 10 years or 15 years of deregulation has been quite uh, tailored in terms of how do you manage this big monopoly which means uh, or the incumbent and which means the policies are so much like you know encouraging other monopolies to be set up so that they can be managed in the same way the monopoly is being managed mm -hmm. and that that brings me to the point where you know a lot of these countries try to regulate the market instead of trying to encourage innovation and new approaches to doing uh, connectivity telephony and things like that. And which brings me to my pet peeve these days is a lot of markets or a lot of regulators see ISPs and any kind of connectivity providers as a source of license revenue and the revenue for the government. And I think, I think all the countries in this region at least have to pay some kind of fee to the regulator on the revenue, not on the profit. And that is kind of basically pushing back you know, from these operators, from going into rural marketplaces or rural areas, developing infrastructure, putting in alternative forms of infrastructure like Wi-Fi or, um, you know, cheaper access to, you know, take services to the people. And that, that's, that is not happening. And, I mean, in this, at least in Nepal, we have this very successful model of community radio stations. And, but then, I have not seen a single community ISP in the whole uh, country, or at least in this region, mainly because the policies actively discourage that kind of a process. Because the policies seem to think, or the regulation seems to more be geared towards, we need to manage this properly, like we do the incumbent. We can't let these people do this thing on their own. And then, you know, each time I go to a regulator, they talk about five nines of reliability. And, you know, the, all of those things kind of stopped making sense uh, to me a long ago because uh, you really can't do five nines of reliability in, in countries, in developing countries anyway, without spending a huge amount of money. And even that is not enough. Right? So that, that's been, uh, and I think regulators and more countries need to adapt the regulation so that more innovative approaches to rural telecom, rural ways of doing things, 
is there rather than you know asking the service providers to put funny money into this what is called the universal service obligation fund that doesn't get used or gets used for something the minister likes or something like that yeah Go ahead. Um, one thing that uh, struck me in Argentina during the one workshop that we did for a wireless mm -hmm. project a few uh, last year was um, that 